I'm not going to speak for both of us, uh, but the last time I was standing here was three years ago, basically today, and I've been looking forward to being back in this room with all of you again for three years. So um, this is a special community. It's really wonderful to be back for an in-person Buzzwords this year. With that said, this is a community talk. We have a few disclaimers. We both work for NVIDIA. We'll be talking about some NVIDIA technologies and some things that we do at work in this talk, but we're both here as members of this community. We're not speaking for our employer. We have access to incredible hardware at work, but for this talk, we really wanted to show places where working data scientists can easily benefit from acceleration using resources that they might have access to. So Sophie looked at running workloads inexpensively in the public cloud, and I ran workloads on my personal Linux machine, which has an NVIDIA GeForce GPU. And a final disclaimer is that making these things fast is not the day job for either of us. We aren't performance experts. We've used the technologies that we're talking about to make our work faster, but we've almost certainly left performance on the table in the examples we'll show. So we wanted to show results that practitioners could realistically get without heroic effort or really unobtainable hardware. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We'll start with some basic definitions. We'll look at what data science is, what acceleration is, why it's important, what kinds of acceleration we can expect. We'll look at places where acceleration is nice to have and at the increasing number of places where acceleration is necessary to get our work done. Then we'll look at some ways that we can scale up with alternate libraries that let us work in a way we're comfortable with but benefit from accelerated execution. We'll look at four case studies, three positive results and an interesting negative result, and see some of the successes and challenges we've had accelerating everyday data science code. We'll identify some common pitfalls that you'll want to look out for as you're using this for your own work, and we'll talk briefly about how we could scale out to multiple machines and why that's interesting even if we don't necessarily have multiple machines. So let's start with some basic definitions. Who in here would identify as a data scientist? Okay, good, about a, about a third of the room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so data science, you know, 10 years ago was a really broad role that covered an end-to-end -end process from discovery to production with a lot of things in between, right? Today, it's narrower and much more specialized. We basically use it to mean exploratory analysis, descriptive analytics, and the process of preparing data for and training a model. Things like dimensionality reduction, visualization, feature extraction, model training, validation, and explainability. These are workloads that involve a lot of linear algebra, which is generally easy to accelerate, and a lot of array-at-a-time operations, right, where you're operating on a collection of values rather than on individual values one at a time. We're going to be focusing on the Python ecosystem, not because we don't love R or Julia, but because that's where we do most of our work and that's what we're most familiar with. So some things that are out of scope for this talk, languages other than Python, the deep learning ecosystem, because pretty much everyone knows that deep learning accelerates, and it's interesting, but we're not going to have time to talk about it today. Frameworks like Spark, Flink, or databases, some of which can accelerate, but again, we uh, are sort of trying to narrowly focus the scope for this talk. Um, and things like probabilistic programming languages are also out of scope. We're not trying to say that these things aren't data science or that data scientists don't use these things. Again, we're just trying to have a focused talk so that we can give you something interesting in 40 minutes. So let's look at the recent history of accelerated computing, and I mean recent sort of in human history terms. If we go back to 1967, we see the introduction of Thomas Sulo's algorithm, which basically was one of the first times that we really acknowledged that if we want to run programs faster, we need to run more things in parallel. And we might have to transform the program either as we write it or as we execute it in order to exploit that parallelism. And basically, a lot of innovations in computer architecture in the last 55 years or so have involved figuring out ways to run more things in parallel. So in this case, we could maybe say we're going to dynamically reorder the instructions we execute so that we can run multiple operations in parallel if we have different kinds of functional units in a processor that can do the same thing. So we can rearrange this program so it can safely overlap. It might mean providing a programming model so that a practitioner would explicitly 
notate things that could run in parallel and structure their programs to exploit that parallelism. Or it might mean that we have to predict the future so that we could use more of these techniques speculatively and then be able to correct our errors if they turn out to be wrong. Right? So we have a sort of a spectrum of approaches in hardware and we have a spectrum of approaches in software as well. We could imagine a way to sort of transparently accelerate code with no sort of special effort by the programmer. And that would basically look like taking code that we would write to run without acceleration and having a way to have a runtime or a library that runs it with acceleration. So that could be as simple as just replacing an import with a different library or even just using a different runtime or linking in a different, different library. We could also imagine a programming model that made this more explicit, enabled us to get more performance, and had us sort of closer to the metal, as, as one might say. And here's an example of what that would look like. This is a C program. This is uh, example code from the Wikipedia article for the OpenMP C library. And what these directives mean in the green is that we're saying that each iteration of a loop should execute in parallel, and that's saying sort of how to distribute those loop iterations across processors. So we've seen two extremes here of one is sort of, I don't have to do anything to make my code run in parallel, or I have to do very little. And the other extreme is I'm going to sort of orchestrate in my code how it's going to run on separate processors or separate threads. And not every approach it fits one of these two extremes. There are also some interesting parallel libraries that are mostly transparent, but that require some code changes. We'll call this a hybrid approach, and we'll be talking about a lot of these in the talk. But a lot of these differences are differences of degree rather than essential differences. Nearly everything in the Python data science ecosystem is accelerated in one way or another, and almost nothing is completely transparent. Here's the textbook definition of a dot product. This is an important fundamental operation in many machine learning algorithms for identifying how similar things are. Basically, you take every pair of corresponding elements of vectors with equal length, multiply them together, and add all the products. If you were going to do a textbook implementation of matrix multiplication, you'd be doing a lot of these as well. Now, we can naturally translate that into Python pretty directly by using a zip to combine those corresponding elements, a comprehension to get their products, and a sum to add all of those together. But you could also use a library routine like this. Now, why might I want to use the library routine instead of just using that Python that looks exactly like the definition? Yes? It's much, much faster, yeah. Yeah, it means that you're executing an optimized library routine, probably executing many of these additions and multiplications in parallel, and that direct Python implementation is doing everything in a high-level language, one operation at a time, one element at a time, it's going to be a lot slower. So the point here is that as data scientists, we're already used to thinking a bit about how our code actually executes you probably wouldn't write an explicit for loop in NumPy or Pandas unless you absolutely had no other way to solve a problem. But you know, there's, there's no shame here. We can raise our hand if we've had to learn this lesson the hard way. <laughs> so you might not want to become an expert in writing high-performance code. I think the sweet spot is where you're able to write better code that's clear and understand enough about how it'll be executed to benefit from accelerated hardware and software stacks. So let's talk about when performance is nice to have and when it's essential. And this is, some, this is a sentence that I wrote in my notes last spring. Sophie and I were in the process of working together to port some code from scikit-learn and pandas to use accelerated libraries. And this was the first time I realized that my thinking on acceleration and what it means had really shifted over the years. In my first couple of years of graduate school, I worked in a lab investigating and building tools for understanding the performance of large-scale parallel programs. So I spent a fair amount of time adjacent to the high-performance computing and supercomputing worlds. And I remember thinking that in those worlds, a lot of effort went into solving very difficult problems that very few people actually had. So these problems were interesting and important and you know, difficult. But at the same time, it felt like I could have more impact as a computer scientist by making it easier to exploit parallelism at a smaller scale and benefiting everyday computer users more. 
So things have changed a lot since I was a junior graduate student, and now everyday computing, even on your phone or your watch, depends on many techniques that were just completely infeasible when I started graduate school. And data science is no exception. I'm still really interested in helping practitioners, everyday practitioners, take advantage of high performance infrastructure for everyday problems. But now it seems like there are more things that are possible only if they're fast. An example of this in data science is, as we'll see in a minute, the difference between using a linear dimensionality reduction technique like PCA on the left and a far more expensive nonlinear one like TSNE or UMAP might be the difference between understanding the structure in our data before we even start thinking about a modeling approach and having to guess or having to do more work to figure out where that structure is. Now, some of these nonlinear techniques are technically possible on a CPU, but they may not be feasible. They suffer from a lot of practical issues. They don't scale very well, so if you want to run at interactive latency, you'll need to work with a very small sample of your data. We'll see an example of this in just a second, but I think it's a good opportunity to think about what acceleration might mean for your work and what kinds of things we can make possible. So it's not necessarily just making things faster. It could mean working on larger data sets or larger samples. It might mean meeting a tighter SLA or meeting an existing SLA more comfortably. It might mean considering more dimensions of a problem or solving a more interesting problem in general. It might mean solving the same problem for less money, whether because you need fewer resources to get the same result or because you're not using others' resources for as long. And in the public cloud, there's an interesting sort of intersection of meeting a tighter SLA and saving money. How many people here have used spot pricing before? Okay, a few of you, a few of you, cool. So if you're saving money by using spot pricing, you have a hard deadline to get your work done, and you might know that at the end of any hour, you might lose your resources, but you don't know which hour you would lose those resources in. So it's much cheaper, but the resources could go away at almost any time. And the real challenge with that kind of environment is that if you don't get your problem done before you lose the resource, you've just wasted the money you spent on that infrastructure. Finally, and I think this is one of the most interesting elements for working data scientists, acceleration might mean enabling us to run techniques at interactive latency instead of batch latency. And it's really hard to overstate the impact it can have on your workday if something that you're running as part of your thought process, as part of your creative work that used to take long enough to make a pour over or go out for lunch or go to bed for the night now runs before you lose your train of thought. So now I'm going to hand it over to Sophie, who's going to talk about some libraries that we can use to accelerate these. Thanks, Will. So there's tons of libraries that enable transparent, hybrid, and explicit acceleration of our Python numeric code. Um, today, we're going to focus on a couple of transparent and hybrid approaches. So QPy is the closest thing that we've got um, to transparent acceleration in this space. It's basically a re-implementation of NumPy and SciPy built atop NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and in many cases, you can just drop it in as a straight replacement for NumPy or SciPy, like, show, like so. We've also got Rapids. So Rapids provides accelerated libraries with similar interfaces to your popular data science frameworks. For example, QDF is a data frame library with a pandas-like interface, and QML is a machine learning library that overlaps with scikit-learn. Uh, QGraph is a graph processing library, unsurprisingly, and it's very similar to Network X. And these libraries also scale out across clusters with Dask, and it interoperate with other ecosystem libraries and support accelerated inference. Now, if you want to dive deeper, you can. Um, we won't dive deeper into these libraries in our talk today, but there's some attractive options for writing custom code that can accelerate on GPUs or CPUs in Python. So definitely start out with one of the higher level libraries first, but then check out one of these if you need some uh, custom code to run fast. So with that, I think we're ready to dive into case studies. Um, so for our first case study, I want to focus on that data science in a loop, that feature extraction, exploring your data, model training and tuning, and model validation. As a data scientist, this is certainly where I spend a lot of my time, and it's a very iterative process, going back and trying out new techniques. 
So the example we're going to use here is a classification problem. We've got a data set which has severely imbalanced classes. So we've got two classes of data, but we've got significantly more samples from one than we do from the other. So let's take a look at what visualization, visualizing that data looks like um, on CPU and on GPU. So we will start on CPU. Um, I start by doing some feature engineering just to put our data into a form that we're happy with. And then we're going to begin using PCA. So PCA is an age-old technique now that um, can be used to map your data onto principal components. In this example, we are mapping onto two components because we can nicely visualize things in 2D. So we take our data that contains two different classes. We map it down to 2D. You see we can do that on the CPU in six seconds. And we can go ahead and plot that. And what we can't really see is a nice separation between the classes. So the classes are shown in orange and blue there. There's no clear distinction. So let's move on to a more sophisticated technique. We can head over and use T-SNE. Um, now, we're only working on a sample of our data here because we want this to run in less than 40 minutes. Otherwise, you'd have to sit here and watch my code run. Um, so we're working, I think, on about 0.5% uh, of the data to train the T-SNE. Oh, yes. Um, and that's taking about 10 seconds. Now, because we're subsampling, you can see we haven't got many of the orange points from our lower class, but it looked like maybe there was some structure there. So let's go ahead and use an even more sophisticated technique, UMAP. Um, so UMAP is using uh, nonlinear manifolds. It projects our data onto nonlinear manifolds, so it's more computationally expensive than PCA and T-SNE. But again, we have to subsample our data significantly um, both in terms of the amount of data that we use to train our UMAP and also the amount that we project or transform for our visualization when we're working on CPU. So a huge disadvantage of having to subsample our data in this situation where we've got imbalanced classes is that if we just subsample at random, then we're going to see much smaller representation from that class that has smaller number of components in it. And so as such, it's really difficult for us to learn anything really about that class. And on the subsample data, again, we're not seeing clear definition between our two classes once we map it down to two dimensions. So in comes the GPU. Um, let's see what we can do here. We're still working on a sample of our data set to transform the data. Um, sorry, to train our UMAP model um, itself. And then we go ahead and transform some of our data. Um, this is working within an interactive time. So as a data scientist, I won't have you know, gone off to put the coffee machine on or check my emails or got distracted, distracted by Slack. Um, and we can see here that we're starting to see some structure. So we've got those uh, class denoted by orange kind of circling in the center and some blue dots around the outside. So what I hope that this shows is that if we move to the GPU, it allows us to remain uh, in that interactive latency. Um, I'm not going out of my feedback loop. I'm not running off and away from my computer. And I'm able to gain more insight into my data and understand better what's happening. And another huge advantage of this, um, particularly for UMAP, is that UMAP is very sensitive to hyperparameters. We don't know in advance which hyperparameters we want to choose and which are going to be good. So if we're able to run things quickly and iteratively, then this speedup allows us to experiment with different parameterizations of our model. OK, so we've visualized our data. We've found some features that we're happy with. <laughs> Skipped a few little details there. But we're moving on to model training. And particularly for this classification model, we're going to use gradient boosted trees using the XGBoost library. So the basic idea here is to start with one weak learner um, and train new learners focusing on the mispredicted examples. 
and the aggregation, um, the aggregation of the predictions of many of these weak learners is going to be a much better model. So trees are great for this because every level of the tree lets us double the number of possibilities that we consider for our data. If you think of playing the game 20 questions, um, hopefully that translates across cultures and languages, um, then if you ask the right questions, then you can narrow down from many examples to a single answer very quickly. Um, but doing so requires you to ask questions that will split the remaining possibilities well. So XGBoost offers many different ways to implement this. Um, the simplest is to precisely track each sample every time we're deciding how to split the samples in the tree. So this is completely accurate, but it's very slow. A second option is to use a sketch or a scalable approximation of a histogram of these samples um, to decide how and where to split a tree and which question to ask next. So this technique isn't quite as accurate as the exact method, but it parallelizes very well um, and can even run on a cluster. So being able to run it faster on a multi-core CPU or GPU can really improve the velocity of our data science workflows, and it makes it easier to tune hyperparameters quickly. Now, because this technique is amenable to parallel execution, we can run it on the GPU as well. And as you can see, it's a very simple code change to go from that CPU to GPU implementation. So I ran this on some cheap resources in the public cloud that are readily available. Um, and going from CPU to GPU, I got a 10 times speed up. Um, that was when I was using the full data, 100% of my data. If I subsampled my data on CPU, so not using all of my data set to train my model, which is not ideal anyway, um, and only used 10% of that data, it was still two times quicker to run it on the GPU with all of my data. Will you run this on your workstation? Um, and the speed up was three times faster when training four times as much data on the GPU. OK. So for our second case study, I want to talk about how hardware acceleration can dramatically improve the performance of a simple prototype. Oftentimes, I mean, who's been in this situation? You want to try out a new technique that you don't have a library implementation for, and you need to write it yourself. Anyone? A few of us? So. There's a big difference, right, between the code that you would write in NumPy that's basically a straight up translation of what you read in a paper and code that you'd actually run in production. It's, it's really interesting to be able to try things out, but often it's really hard to sort of scale these out or it's hard to evaluate them if they take a long time. So we're going to look at self-organizing maps, which are actually like a 30-year-old technique. It's a dimensionality reduction technique that can work really well for high dimensional data that aren't linearly separable. And these are close to my heart. Um, you know, six years ago, I implemented a parallel version of these to scale out for clusters on Spark to solve a problem understanding data center logs at scale. And I've always wondered how much how much faster it could be or, or how fast it could be running on a single node. Or I wanted to use this in without Spark in, in Python projects. So I basically built a straightforward implementation of this algorithm and wanted to see how it looks. So let's explain what it's doing. The goal here is to have a relatively small and relatively low dimensional map of representative vectors done from the giant distribution of our features. You can think of these as sort of like cluster centers. And we want similar entries in the map to represent objects that are nearby in feature space, right? So if things are close together on the map, they're close together in real life. And in the classic online training algorithm for self organizing maps, we start with a initial map. We can initialize this however we want, but Usually it's either random or drawn from the principal components of our, our data. So let's say that this is a random map of colors. Um, and then we're going to repeatedly consider all of the examples in our training set. And when we see an example, we're going to identify the entry in the map that's closest to it, which we call the best matching unit. We're then going to update the map to bring the entries around the best matching unit closer to the example that match that best matching unit. And we're going to do this 
by considering a Gaussian neighborhood around that node so that we update the node itself the most and the nodes that are around it increasingly, sort of decreasingly less and less. Now, this technique is pretty powerful and we can actually fit an implementation of it in Python pseudocode on a single slide, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so we're going to start by shuffling the training set, processing it in random order. And this helps us prevent the accidental organization of our training data from biasing the map that we ultimately train. And there are a couple of interesting hyperparameters here in that process. Um, how we define the neighborhood size by the standard deviation of the Gaussian neighborhood and how we define the learning rate, which is basically how much we weight our updates to the map with each iteration. Uh, and both of these we're defining as a function of training time so we can make their values decrease with time. And basically this is just sort of what we just saw in the previous slide. I think it might be helpful to sort of show how this whole process looks by animating training a map of colors going from random colors to an organized map. So here we're looking at a map of colors. This is a randomly organized map, and we're going to see a number of training iterations in an animation as we get to a self-organized map based on angular similarity. So angular similarity is nice for colors because you sort of get hues matching one another, right? But we can see how this map becomes more and more saturated and how these colors sort of spread out and separate and organize themselves over time. And ultimately, we'll get you know, some really clear separation between these colors and eventually we'll get some sort of different, uh, different values of colors that have similar angular similarity but different Euclidean distances closer together as well. Now, the cool thing about this algorithm is that the most expensive part of this code is in calculating and scaling those neighborhood functions. This involves a couple of matrix multiplications and these can accelerate really well. Now, the interesting thing that, that I saw in this code is that this is not a parallel algorithm. I sort of came up with a way to do this in parallel a while ago. This is the standard online one sample at a time algorithm that has a lot of features that would make it difficult to parallelize. If you were gonna run this code in production, you would not be writing a naive rendering of the one sample at a time algorithm from the paper. But because we spend enough time in these expensive and easy to parallelize matrix multiplications, the CuPy implementation involves essentially one code change, which I'll get to in a second, and it's over three times faster on an input of four-dimensional feature vectors, so like our colors with an alpha channel, and it's over six times faster on an input with 16-dimensional feature vectors. And the interesting thing here is that to run the 16-dimensional feature vectors on CuPy is actually about the same time as running the four-dimensional feature vectors because neither of them is saturating the capacity of the accelerated hardware for doing matrix multiplications in parallel. So the only change I had to make was that I was using new style NumPy random number generators and CuPy does not support the new style um, NumPy random number generators. You have to use the uh, random state classes instead. So. I think that enabling a practitioner to implement a simple and serial version of an algorithm and get results faster is a really interesting kind of acceleration, right? I, it can be fun to develop high performance code and to think about why your code is slow and think about how to make it faster, but I kind of prefer saving the time that I would have spent debugging and thinking and implementing things, you know, even to saving runtime on something that I've already written. For the third case study, we're going to think about explaining the predictions that our models make. So being able to understand and explain the predictions um, a model is making is useful from a few angles. First and foremost, if you're able to see which features of your model impact the predictions made, you can check that the model is working in line with your beliefs about the data. It's an easy way to check that your model isn't doing anything that you deem to be ridiculous. Um, another useful angle is the regular 
regulatory compliance required across many geos and industries that insists that we must be able to explain the predictions that have been made by models if they're used to impact real people or business decisions. And even if you're not bound by compliance, it's really useful and important to understand why your model is giving you certain results. So Shapley additive explanation values, more commonly known as SHAP values, are based on this game theoretic framework for modeling the contributions of multiple players to an outcome in a game and are widely used for model explainability. Now, SHAP is a local explainability technique. So basically, it allows us to say on the boundaries of our model's decisions, what would cause something we predicted to be one class to be predicted as another. So we ran SHAP on this XG boost classification model that we talked about earlier. And actually, that's really simple. It requires only one additional argument to be added to the XG boost call in order to get these SHAP values. And going from CPU on 10% of our data to GPU on the full data set uh, gave us a 10 times speed up. And this is actually a great example of where acceleration allows us to use more advanced methods. Um, it's interesting to consider the importance of individual features in the predictions that we made, but we can do better and consider the importance of feature interactions. So what we're plotting here is the importances of various feature interactions, which we do by calculating the mean magnitude of the interaction's importance um, across every prediction that we made. So you can see in the aggregate, some of these are, have minimal importance, but some are interesting. Nevertheless, these combinations uh, might be important for a given prediction. And we can go further than that. So we could look at, for example, the in interactions within just one of our two classes and see how they compare to the interactions impacting our predictions in the other class. So, Will? For our last case study, I want to talk about an interesting negative result. Right? That's, that's, I'm glad to be able to present a negative result. It's always sort of fun to hear about what didn't work, right? And we're going to talk about discrete event simulations. I, who here has written or used discrete event simulation before? Okay, so just a, just a few of us. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of context. So basically, this is a technique for modeling something that happens in the real world as a discrete system of time steps. And at each step, something will happen. You'll update the state of the world in some way based on you know, some state transitions. And we can use this technique for something very simple, like modeling how long the queue will get at a store, um, given how many customers arrive at the till and how fast they can check out, or for more complicated cases, like simulating the behavior of a hypothetical computer architecture that we haven't built yet on different workloads without building the hardware and you know, compiling, building the compiler and running the workload. Now, for everything that happens in these discrete event simulations, each aspect of this system is modeled by drawing from probability distributions. So we might draw the inner arrival times for customers from an exponential distribution. We might draw the number of items in a customer's basket from a Poisson distribution. As you can imagine, if you're simulating some non-trivial phenomena, this involves a ton of sampling. So I had a complex discrete event simulation that took a long time to run. It was written fairly naively in straightforward Python. To get the results I wanted took a couple of days. Um, accelerating with CuPy seemed like a really attractive prospect because my code was heavy in NumPy and SciPy. But unfortunately, I'd written my code to depend on some SciPy features that weren't available in CuPy. I was able to re-implement some of them, and the parts of my simulation that could run on CuPy were dramatically faster than they were on NumPy and SciPy alone, but the whole exercise gave me a lot of ideas for how to more thoroughly refactor this code because it could also scale out. And I basically went back to the drawing board and said, you know, I'm really going to need to revisit this code and write it to be more efficient in general. But we'll talk about the specific challenge I had with that in just a second. So that's actually a, a good sort of um, it's good to think about what you use in, in your code, right? And I mentioned earlier in the self-organizing maps that one of the challenges I had with CuPy was that I used the new style NumPy random number generators, and CuPy didn't support those. Libraries that offer transparent or mostly transparent acceleration are really challenging to develop. 
Um, I have a lot of sympathy for people who try and do this because the libraries they're replacing or the libraries that they're supposed to serve as are moving targets. Like you might spend a lot of effort coming up with a great re-implementation of 95% of NumPy 1.17. That's an enormous achievement, right? But someone is going to need that 5% that you didn't implement or some feature that's introduced in NumPy 1.18, like, like say, uh, new style random number generators. Um, and a common theme that we've seen is that we sometimes have to be creative or re-implement some simple functionality in order to work around missing features. And sometimes we have to re-implement complex functionality. I mean, if you're thinking about sampling from probability distributions, sometimes those are easy, sometimes those are, those are difficult to, to implement. And in CuPy in particular, the new style pseudorandom number generators and probability distributions were a pain point for us in our work. One of the biggest challenges we face in this sort of work is actually a family of challenges. Most Python code and most data, Python data science code is untyped. We don't necessarily know what kinds of things the value that a variable can hold might be able to do. We don't necessarily know what kinds of values a variable might hold, but we do know what kinds of things it might be able to do. A given value might be a one-dimensional NumPy array, a row matrix, a series, a data frame, a Python list, any number of things, but a lot of code that we might use in libraries can deal with all of those things. This is often called duck typing, after the adage, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. But if you've ever looked at the implementation of scikit-learn or pandas or, or code that works in these ecosystems, you know that it takes a ton of work to write code that works with a wide range of inputs, and it's really challenging to get that code right. So we've seen some cases where drop-in replacement libraries don't always work with code that expects the original, and we've seen cases where it was a bug in both the drop-in library or the library that it's interoperating with. Often we need to think about where our data are in hybrid acceleration approaches. If we have some operations that need to run on the GPU or that can only run on the CPU, we'll need to make sure we move the data that we're going to operate on. This is a common concern in DL frameworks and in XGBoost as well. If you're running XGBoost on a cluster, you need to use a different representation, for example, than if you're running on a single node. And this is often an issue in conjunction with duct typing because some, some libraries, plotting libraries in particular, expect data on the CPU, not data that has the same interface as data on the CPU. And if we just sort of work around this by copying data wherever we think it might be a problem, we can introduce performance issues and negate the benefit of that code. So this is something to consider as well. Finally, I want to talk sort of briefly about scaling out and why we might want to scale out even if we're not using multiple machines. So for a lot of the problems that we look at, scaling out can be interesting and clusters can be great, right? Like if you're doing hyperparameter tuning, you might want to run a bunch of experiments in parallel. But with structured data, if you're training a model, most recent consumer GPUs are large enough to handle a lot of the problems you're dealing with, right? I mean, if you have a GPU with eight gigabytes of memory, Eight gigabytes of tabular structured data is actually kind of a lot of <laughs> tabular structured data, right? Um, but scaling out is interesting, even if you're not running on a cluster, because the same techniques that you use to scale out, those partitioned collections, um, being able to operate on something that's larger than you can hold in memory, is interesting if you want to solve a problem that you can't solve on your own machine in the amount of memory that you have you know, for your CPU or your GPU. So. The things to consider are libraries like Dask, which enables you to sort of share Python operations across a cluster, and some libraries like XGBoost support clustered execution natively. All right. All right, so what have we whizzed through today? Uh, thanks for sticking with us. So fundamentally, we talked about what acceleration is, and then we thought about what it means to us as practitioners, be that speeding up our code or accelerating practitioner velocity and the ability to iterate. We looked at a few case studies. Um, we thought about visualization and XGBoost. Um, we also looked at self-organizing maps and talked about model explainability and discrete event simulation um, as an interesting negative case where we haven't quite got our ducks in a row. Um, finally, we looked at common challenges, thinking about using the right tool for the job, duck typing, um, and data transport from CPU to GPU.
We're really excited about the potential for advanced infrastructure and for acceleration to make data scientists' lives and work better and to enable data scientists to discover more things and make the world better. So we hope this talk has shown you how easy it is to get started and what kinds of benefits you can expect for a little bit of effort. We'd love to hear how you're using these techniques in your work or how you think you might be able to use these techniques in your work. And this is how to get in touch with us on Twitter or GitHub. It's great to be here. <laughs>